Okay, so um, in the last few chapters, we've mostly been focused on thinking about solid objects in the world around us, right? Things that keep their shape or resist deformations like an elastic ball and so on and so forth. Um, but a lot of the world around us is a fluid, right? And a fluid is a word that refers to either a liquid or a gas. Um, so, you know, air and water come to mind uh, and, and, you know, many others. So unlike solid objects, fluids uh, don't hold a well-defined shape. And so it's harder to, like, exert forces directly on them. And when we do exert forces on them, sometimes they move in ways that are a little bit unusual. Um, they do still obey all of the same laws of motion and the same kind of conservation laws that we've encountered so far. But thinking about how those laws apply to systems that don't hold their own shape um, sometimes gets a little bit harder. Right? So if an object isn't a rigid mass, thinking about how Newton's equations hold or thinking about how conservation laws apply uh, gets a little bit more complicated. So <clears throat> in this chapter, we're going to start thinking about these kind of amorphous flowing systems. Uh, we'll figure out why uh, balloons uh, and boats float in air and water, respectively. Um, and for instance, we'll think about why, you know, gravity applies to everything. How come the gravitational pull of the Earth isn't pulling all of the air molecules all the way down uh, right against the ground, right? So uh, let's get started thinking about uh, precisely that question um, uh, in section 6.1 of these lecture notes, which talks about gases. Right. So, uh, as I said, gravity acts on the molecules and atoms in a gas in the same way that gravity acts on everything else. So how is it that, uh, for instance, a helium-filled balloon can float, right? Uh, a helium balloon is filled with this gas, helium. Helium has mass, so by the universal law of gravitation, you might say, well, why isn't the gravity of the Earth pulling the helium atoms inside the balloon down to the ground? You know, instead, what we observe is that if we let go of a helium balloon, it floats away, right? What's going on and what forces haven't we accounted for here? The fact is there are forces that we're ignoring um, because gravity is trying to pull the helium-filled balloon down. It's just that there's something else trying to make it uh, go up. So before we can easily think about the physical forces that are holding balloons up or lifting them up, um, we have to start by just thinking about gases in general, right? So the air around us has mass. Um, and what makes uh, gas different from, uh, you know, solids is that uh, gases have, gases have um, neither a fixed shape, neither a fixed shape, um, nor size. So a gas will expand to fill up and fit inside whatever container uh, it's put in, right? So the same number of molecules of air, for instance, can be... Um, used to fill up your dorm room, or the same number of molecules of air can be shoved inside maybe about a dozen uh, scuba diving cylinders, right? The fact that gases are so malleable, so protein, uh, is kind of a reflection of the fact that at the microscopic level, they look very different from what a solid object looks like. You know, so for instance, let's compare and contrast. Um, here, I'm going to draw um, a representative schematic of the atoms inside a crystal. This kind of gets back to the nature is organized by symmetry argument that we gave or that I introduced in the very first chapter of these lecture notes. So in a crystal, all of the atoms composing a crystal, like maybe all the carbon atoms in, um, in a di piece of diamond or something, are sitting in a very regular lattice-like arrangement. Um, this particular lattice isn't what a diamond look like, looks like, but it's much easier for me to draw in two dimensions. Right? So in a crystalline system, um, all of the atoms are sitting in a very specific place, and this gives them a very particular kind of symmetrical arrangement, and it lets solid objects be solid. It lets the atoms resist deformations because, um, you know, all of these atoms want to be in specific places by the arrangement of the solid. You know, in contrast, um, a gas, a gas looks uh, totally different. And since that's where the camera's going to be, let me scroll down, I suppose. Uh, in contrast, a gas looks totally different. Um, the atoms in a gas are just all over the place, flying around at high speeds with no kind of order or rhyme or reason to where any particular atom is in relation to everything else, right? In a crystal, if you tell me the kind of symmetrical structure of the crystal and you give me the position of any one atom, I can tell you where every other atom in the crystal is. In a gas, no such luck. You tell me where one gas atom is or gas particle is, and I have no idea where every other gas particle is. So these kind of atoms and molecules that make up, say, the air around us, um, these atoms and molecules are just flying around um, in every which direction, occasionally colliding with each other, 
um, and colliding with the walls of their containers. So, um, so for instance, why is it that gases fill up available space? Why is it that all the air isn't just settled, you know, right against the ground uh, on the surface of the Earth? Um, ultimately, it's because um, gases uh, gases have thermal energy, have thermal energy. Um, and we've kind of talked loosely about, um, you know, the fact that energy sometimes goes into thermal friction, for instance, like the frictional heating, or into thermal, um, thermal energies as you heat something up. But we haven't really talked about, you know, how thermal energy actually manifests itself. Well, in gases, heat is basically a reflection of the fact that the atoms in the gas have a lot of kinetic energy. Sometimes this is called um, internal kinetic energy. Internal kinetic energy. And it's called that because it's like the individual atoms in the gas are all flying around every which way at high speeds, but it's not like the whole gas necessarily is, you know, moving coherently in the same direction, right? So when a rigid object has kinetic energy, you know, the whole thing is moving through space. When a volume of gas has kinetic energy, the components of the gas are kind of flying all over the place, but the gas as a whole can be staying in the same place. So there's no overall kinetic energy, but there's lots of internal motions, right? Um, so this internal kinetic energy, it's like undirected kinetic energy that's not going into the overall motion of the particles. Okay, so, so the individual molecules of this gas are actually flying around at very high speeds. Um, and uh, the hotter, uh, a hotter gas, for instance, is one in which the particles are flying around or spinning around or vibrating uh, in their chemical bonds um, faster than a colder gas is, which uh, is, say, composed of the same substance. Right? So one way of measuring this uh, thermal energy of gases or this internal kinetic energy is in the temperature. So temperature is like a measure of how much internal kinetic energy um, these gas particles, these gases have. Okay, um, just to give you some numbers, uh, just to give you some numbers, um, you know, air is a mixture of things like oxygen and nitrogen and so on. Um, so uh, in, let's say, air at room temperature, room temperature, uh, in air at room temperature, for instance, um, an O2 molecule, so two oxygen atoms connected with a, with a chemical bond, um, you know, the size of this, uh, that might only be, well, very small, something like 2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, okay, about a minute, you know, a minute amount of size. Um, the mass of an oxygen molecule, um, that might be something like 2.6 uh, times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms, right? So these molecules, you know, atoms, as I'm sure you know, are tiny. They have barely any mass at all, um, but because their mass is so small, uh, they can actually be flying around quite quickly from just like the small kind of thermal kicks and nudges that they get. Um, and so, you know, the speed of an oxygen molecule flying through the air at room temperature, you know, might be something like 500, 500 meters per second. Okay. Really, really quite fast, uh, right? 500 meters per second or like a thousand miles an hour. Um, and so because they uh, collide and bounce so frequently, they actually don't spend a lot of time Kind of consistently moving in the same direction before they bounce off of something, uh, something else. And this kind of random collision-filled existence uh, tends to spread gas particles out as far as possible from each other and, until they kind of fill up an available container. So if I kind of started with a cluster of gas particles and somehow you know I'm storing them in a tiny container and then I let go of that container, you know the molecules here are moving really quickly, and so they'll very quickly spread out, fill up the available space until they reach some kind of steady state of how often they bounce off the walls of their new container. Um, so let's think, about, uh, let's think about this kind of process a little bit more. Uh, and this is going to be thinking about um, air pressure, air pressure, and the ideal gas law. Right. So I'm sure we've heard words like, you know, air pressure before, right? Every time you fill up um, your bike tire by shoving more air into it, or you inflate the tires of your car, or you pump up like a football or a soccer ball, um, you're kind of thinking about changing the pressure of a gas inside some other object. And so let's think about what's going on, say, inside a bike tire, a tube filled up with air, which is at 
uh, a higher pressure than the air you know outside of us right so inside the tube what's going on um, let me let me you know not try to draw a tube but just you know draw another box I've got these disordered collections of you know particles of air nitrogens and oxygens and whatever um, you know randomly distributed inside of this inside of this box and they all you know, are flying around with some velocity. The internal kinetic energy, something that we might call the temperature of the air inside of this uh, tire, is reflected in how these particles are flying around, right? And most of the time, they just fly through space until they bounce off of something, right? But uh, when they do bounce off of something, what happens? Say, like, it's colliding with this wall, and then it's going to bounce off the wall and start flying in some new direction, right? What's happening here? Well, what's happening here is that this particle as it bounces off the wall, um, experiences a change in its momentum. Experiences a change in its momentum. Change in its momentum. Right? This particle of air has some mass, it has some velocity, and then after the collision, um, that velocity has changed, and so its momentum must have changed. Right? So uh, the fact that the particle experienced a change in its momentum, um, that means that the particle um, experienced a force, particle experienced uh, a force um, uh, during some collision time, during some collision time. Right, the change in momentum, the impulse of, uh, that was felt by this particle being given by you know, all of the forces that it experienced through some collision time. Okay, so uh, of course in the collision with the wall, what was exerting this force? Well, the, the wall was exerting a force on the particle to get it to change its uh, velocity. Um, and by Newton's third law, we know that that means that the particle uh, exerted an equal magnitude force in the opposite direction on the wall of the container, in this case on the wall of this, um, wall of this uh, box, right? Um, so, you know, each individual uh, change in momentum, you know, if we say that the particle was originally moving at 500 meters per second in this direction, and then it ended up moving at 500 meters per second in that direction, uh, you know, that means that the particle changed its velocity by some amount to the left in this uh, instance. Um, you know, the mass is very small, uh, but all of these collisions kind of add up, right? Uh, the walls are constantly being bombarded by these tiny but high-speed collisions, Particle is constantly exerting a force on the wall as the wall exerts the force back needed to get the particles to change their momentum. Uh, and so the sum of all of these collisions, kind of, you know, the collisions aren't all aligned with each other. It's not like all the particles flow to the left and then all to the right. They're just going every which way. Um, and so there's not a coherent net force on the tire, but there's an average amount of force exerted on all of the walls of the container, right? All of the walls of the tube inside your bike tire, for instance. And this is what we mean by a pressure, right? So a pressure, a pressure is defined as like a force acting on a surface area, acting on a surface area. Okay. Um, so in this case, the pressure, say, on, on the walls of your bike tire, are again composed by all of the disordered tiny collisions going on constantly between the air molecules you've shoved inside the tire and the walls of the tire itself. Um, so we can already see that the dimensions of pressure are whatever the dimensions of force are divided by the dimensions of surface area. Um, and the SI units, units of pressure, are the Pascal are, let's say, one Pascal, uh, and this is abbreviated PA, okay? And one Pascal, uh, which is equal to one Newton divided by one meter squared, so Pascal is defined by taking the SI unit of force and making a square of the SI unit of uh, length. One Pascal is not very much. Um, so for reference, if I have a stack of paper, here, it looks like I've got two pieces of normal notebook paper. If I had a stack of 13 pieces of notebook paper and let them rest on the table, the pressure of that stack of paper resting on the table would be about a Pascal, more or less, right? So it's a really, effectively a really small um, amount of pressure, this kind of SI unit. Uh, for reference, you know, um, air pressure, air pressure at sea level, 
right? So just the pressure that the atmosphere sitting on top of us um, is exerting on the ground, uh, that's something more like 100,000 pascals, 10 to the 5 pascals. Okay. Just so you know what the units are and have a sense of reference for them. Okay. So again, for a gas uh, exerting a pressure on its container, uh, the pressure is produced by all of these tiny frequent collisions um, between the gas particles and the container wall. And I would say this already gives us an intuition for how pressure will vary as we change things about the gas, right? So for instance, the more frequent the collisions are, um, or the more the momentum changes for each collision, the more the pressure the gas exerts will be, right? So one way to increase the frequency that collisions happen is just to sho shove more molecules of gas inside the container, right? So that's what like a bike pump is doing, right? You're just forcing more and more particles of air inside the bike tire. You're not really appreciably you know, trying to change the temperature of the gas inside the bike tire because it will eventually just kind of be whatever room temperature is. Um, but by having more particles, you'll end up with more collisions on average, right? So if there was just, you know, this many particles, you'd have some number of collisions. If I, you know, added twice as many particles, I would end up with twice as many collisions um, inside, inside the, twice as many collisions between the particles in the gas and the walls of the container. Okay. So uh, if we double the number of particles in the gas, we'll roughly double the number of times a gas particle bounces off one of the walls. Okay. Uh, so that's one way to increase the collision frequency. Um, so, uh, sorry, I should have been writing. Uh, pressure. So intuitively, it's related to uh, collision frequency, frequency, and magnitude of. Uh, this is just what I said earlier. Magnitude of um, changes in momentum. Magnitude of these impulses with each collision. Um, so one way to increase the collision frequency is by changing the number of particles inside the container, right? And if I'm changing the number of particles inside a fixed volume uh, of the container, that's like changing the density of the gas, right? The other way to increase the collision frequency is to make the particles move faster, right? So if, um, if the particles are on average moving faster, right, with each bounce, you know, they'll be changing their momentum more, right? Additionally, with, uh, they'll reduce the time in between collisions, right? So for instance, suppose I have this gas particle um, moving at some speed going down. Uh, if I ignore any other collisions it might have, then you know it's moving at some velocity, it'll bounce off this wall, then this wall, then this wall, then this wall, as it kind of bounces back and forth inside. Well, if I double how fast it's moving, you know, I'll get to this wall quicker, and then I'll get to this wall quicker, and so on and so forth. So I'll increase the collision frequency by making these gas particles move faster, I'll also increase the magnitude of the changes in momentum, right? So for instance, um, suppose, suppose, we, suppose we like quadruple the uh, average kinetic energy, the average internal kinetic energy. So the, uh, suppose we could quadruple the, the uh, kinetic energy of a gas particle, gas particle. Well, remember that kinetic energy, uh, kinetic energy is like one half times the mass of one of these things times its velocity squared. So if we quadruple the kinetic energy, we'll increase the speed by a factor of two, right? We're not changing the mass of the particles and two squared is four. So if we quadruple the kinetic energy, we double the speed, um, but collisions will also happen twice as frequently, right? So we double the speed, which doubles the collision frequency, and also doubles the magnitude of the average changes in momentum. So combined, quadrupling the kinetic energy quadruples the pressure. Okay, so we said that, you know, one way that we can measure this kind of internal kinetic energy of the gas, the kinetic energy associated with the motion, the disordered motion of the gas particles itself, is by this notion of temperature. So um, what we want to say from what we've just discussed about intuitively what pressure will be related to, is that pressure should be something like uh, the density times a temperature. Okay, we quadruple the temperature, we say, and we're quadrupling, you know, both aspects. Uh, we're quadrupling in total the kind of aspects related to temperature. And if we double the density, we double the number of collisions, and so that also feels like it doubles the pressure. So we want to say something like pressure is like a density times a temperature, but we have to be really careful. Um, uh, we have to be, we have to be careful with temperature, have to be careful 
with temperature. And why do I say that, right? Like the temperature scales that we're used to, uh, maybe things like either Celsius or Fahrenheit, are temperatures which can be either positive or negative, right? And we're not going to be, we don't, when we have a gas inside a container, it's not exerting a negative pressure. Um, on the walls of the container, it's always exerting a positive pressure. So the fact that our usual temperature scales can be both positive and negative and zero um, is kind of a problem. So what we have to do, uh, temperature, um, we have to choose, we have to use, when thinking about converting this intuitive picture of how the collisions in a gas particle, between a gas particle and the walls, affect the pressure and um, how it's related to temperature, we have to use uh, an absolute temperature scale. Temperature scale. Okay. And what I mean by that is a temperature scale where zero has a very specific meaning. Um, zero in an absolute temperature scale means there is no motion. So the internal kinetic energy of a gas at absolute zero should be zero. And that means that since gas particles still have mass, they would have actually zero velocity, right? And that's not something that's true of a gas at zero Celsius or zero Fahrenheit, right? Because you can keep cooling down a gas below zero in those unit scales, and the motion of the gas particles just keeps getting slower and slower. We need a temperature scale where zero actually means zero. No kinetic energy uh, internal to the gas, no motion of the particles, right? So the SI, uh, the SI, absolute temperature scale, uh, temperature scale um, is the Kelvin, is the Kelvin scale. Um, uh, temperature scale is uh, Kelvin scale. And one Kelvin um, is defined so that uh, like a change of temperature of something, let's say by one Kelvin, is the same as a change uh, by one degree Celsius, which is about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but zero Kelvin, zero Kelvin uh, is like negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, right? So Kelvins and Celsius are very closely related to each other. It's just zero Kelvin means no motion, absolute zero, whereas zero Celsius just means that's when water would usually freeze, and negative 273.15 Celsius is when motion of gas particles actually stops. Okay. So what we can do using this absolute temperature scale is turn this kind of intuition into uh, an equation, right? Uh, an, a quantitative understanding of how pressure of a gas actually works. And what we have is that pressure is proportional to uh, the density of a gas times the absolute temperature. And again, just to reiterate, why do we need this to be an absolute temperature? Well, suppose this just said temperature, and then I had, you know, the pressure of a gas at 10 degrees Celsius. If I just had a normal temperature here, and then I went from 10 degrees Celsius and I cooled to minus 10 degrees Celsius, this equation, where I say pressure is proportional to the product of these two quantities, would predict that pressure goes from positive to negative. And that is physically not what happens. So if we use an absolute temperature scale, that gives us a absolute frame of reference for what the effect of temperature uh, should be. Right? We need a temperature scale that starts at zero and only goes up so that we can interpret pressure correctly in this way. Um, we can turn this uh, this is almost an equation, right? This is, says pressure is equal to the product of these things up to multiplication by something else. That's what this um, proportionality means. Proportional to. That's what that symbol means if you haven't seen it used like that before. Um, we can make this an equation just by telling you what the constant of proportionality is. So it turns out the constant of proportionality is often called Boltzmann's constant um, after a scientist who maybe I'll tell you more about uh, his unusual life when we uh, talk about phase transitions and temperature more later on. Boltzmann's constant uh, is just some is just some constant. Uh, uh, it's equal to 1.381 uh, times 10 to the minus 23 uh, joules per Kelvin. Uh, so it has units of joules per Kelvin, uh, and 
in the SI units, this is uh, what the value of it is. There's no need for you to memorize this. Um, this is kind of just for your information. Um, you know, you might think about why it makes sense that this number is so small in context of the smallness of gas particles, uh, smallness of atoms, uh, but maybe I'll save that discussion for another day. You can just kind of think about it. Uh, but with that constant of proportionality, I can write um, our intuition of how simple gases behave as the following equation. I can say the pressure, uh, the pressure uh, of a gas is equal to this Boltzmann's constant multiplied by the density of the gas. And let me write the density of the gas as the number of particles of the gas divided by the volume of space that it's filling up, multiplied by temperature, where temperature is in some absolute scale, like Kelvin's, right? Um, this, this is the ideal gas law, and maybe you saw it in chemistry or something. Um, it describes the relationship between pressure and density and temperature of so-called ideal gases. Um, and, you know, it's called the ideal gas law because it refers to a very idealized approximation to the way real gases behave but it turns out to be really a pretty accurate approximation. Um, and so we can already see how it explains things like, you know, when you're driving down a highway and your tires are, you know, rolling really quickly uh, on the ground and there's some amount of frictional heating of them, um, we can understand why the pressure in your tires goes up as your tires get hotter. Your tires get hotter, they heat the gas inside. The same number of molecules is inside that makes the pressure go up, for instance. Right. Um, it also explains why, you know, if you've ever played sports on a really cold day, um, you know, if you take a, a ball and you've inflated it the day before and the temperature drops, uh, the pressure inside the ball goes down because uh, the temperature of the gas uh, is going down. Right. So this is the uh, ideal gas law. Um, maybe you, again, saw it in uh, a chemistry class, uh, in which case you might have seen it as something like, you know, P times V equals uh, Kb times the number of particles times T, you might have seen it as like pressure times volume equals not the number of gas particles times Boltzmann's constant, but the number of moles of gas times some other constant. This is called the gas constant sometimes. Gas constant times temperature. You know, it's all the same equation. It's just, do you choose to count the number of particles, the number of moles of gas? What constants do you have to use to, to make these things uh, work out? Okay, awesome. All right, so that, um, that is how uh, pressure in gases works. Um, at the last section of this chapter, we'll think about gases in liquids. For that, we'll have to think a little bit harder. Um, but this is how pressure in gases work. And this is um, an ideal representation of an equation that relates the pressure of a gas to, to the density of the gas and the temperature. Uh, this is maybe also a time for me to comment that you know, there are not enough letters in the alphabets to uh, consistently refer to only one concept by any given letter. And so you can see we're already starting to reuse, um, you know, the symbols that we meet in this class. So, you know, by context, you should be able to physically think about, well, you know, here we're using the letter P. In this case, the context tells us that we're talking about a pressure. Up here, we needed to use the letter P to think about the magnitude or to think about the momentum of the gas particles that are ultimately causing the pressure, right? So just a little kind of heads up.